Right. Welcome, everybody, and um, a very good morning to folks in um, Asia, Singapore time. Uh, I know we've got folks um, from around the world, so very good day, good evening, and um, in some in some cases, um, in the middle of the night too. So thank you for joining us here uh, for our inaugural STEM speaker series um, organized by United Women Singapore. Our research um, over the last couple of years has shown us that young women and girls actually ask for, they look forward to, they ask for role models when it comes to STEM, to lead them, guide them, counsel them, and for, for them to aspire to. And that was really the reason why we started this series, to inspire young girls to continue into STEM. And what better way to kick off our inaugural STEM series, speaker series, than to do it during Global Space Week and to have the amazing space theme. So I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, my fellow board member, Haslinda Amin, Chief International Correspondent, Southeast Asia for Bloomberg TV, as well as my good friend, and she's going to take us through space into this amazing fireside chat. restart that. Let's talk about Jane Pointer. She's had an extraordinary journey. You may say it's been out of this world, literally. She's ventured into space exploration from the biosphere to experiment back in the 90s to Paragon Space, Worldview, and now Space Perspectives. A commitment to take us all on a space flight. Jane has been dubbed Master of the Stratosphere. Jane, good to see you again. Hi, how are you? Good morning there. Good evening here. <laughs> really exciting times. Now, this dream of taking people to space is 30 years in the making. You've been excited about it. You've been terrified about it. What is it about space that's captured your ima imagination way before Bezos, way before Branson, way before Mars? So I was one of those kids that would, at night, you know, when you were told to go to bed, I would sneak up with my torch and I'd have my Isaac Asimov and I would read it under my bed covers at night. It was just the whole idea of going and exploring the world, the universe, the cosmos. And it didn't hurt that I was lucky enough to grow up by the sea. And I met women who were single-handedly sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, like Claire Francis. She was sort of like this idol of mine when I was a kid. Kind of gave me this idea that we can explore the world. We can go out and go way much further than we can ever imagine we could. That was really part of the genesis of what got me so excited about exploration and space exploration in particular. I heard that your fascination also started ever since you read Isaac Asimov. Uh, and on that note, to build on that, Jane, you talked about how you've been fascinated. But as a teenager, when you were asked to make a choice of what your adult profession is likely to be, you chose to be an air hostess. Take us through that time and what the thinking was. Oh, my gosh. OK, so... <laughs> So this was O-levels and you know, O-levels, it's sort of like in a national exam and this was the English O-level and the topic of the essay we had to write 
was, would you like to be a vet, a nurse, an air hostess, or married? <laughs> I couldn't actually combine either any of the two. So naturally, I would, what we called in those days an air hostess, right? So naturally, I decided, well, of course, I'm going to write about being an air hostess because you get to travel the world. Well, that's right. I would have chosen that as well. I'm just wondering about your formal training. Do you have a formal training in science and engineering? How did you develop the technical skills and knowledge needed? Yeah, so thankfully, we all tend to, to learn in different ways. And I'm, I'm a learning by doing person. So a lot of my training has actually been on the job training. It's been very specialized training that I got. So for example, at the biosphere, we can talk about the biosphere in a minute. So a lot of that training was on the job training. So I was trained by people at the University of Arizona, uh, at uh, the Smithsonian and other places, you know, about entomology, about, the, about ecology, about agriculture, so that's how I learn. I'm not, I'm not a great book learner. So I was really lucky enough to fall into a profession that allowed me to actually do a lot that way, really, by, by, by learning on the job, which was amazing. I had just extraordinary teachers and mentors. But how challenging was the journey? I mean, if we talk about 30 years back, women were hardly in the space business. Women were hardly uh, recognized as talent in the space industry. Well, so, you know, I, I think it's fascinating, right? So, um, you know, all the way back to that essay that I had to write, right? I mean, th that, that's a very limiting choice uh, and not very imaginative either. And I think to a degree, uh, what we expect of our young women is, you know, th the more we expect of them, the more we can excel. Uh, and certainly when I was first in the space industry, I was very often the only woman in the room. Thankfully, that has changed now. Thankfully, that is not the case. Uh, we have a lot of women on our team uh, at Space Perspective. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. But that was certainly the case then. But I never really thought of myself as am I being a woman entrepreneur or a woman scientist. It was, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a space entrepreneur. And I'm being the best space entrepreneur I can be. Uh, and, and that was really how I thought about it. That's still how I think about it today. Before we talk about space perspective, talk to us about your work with NASA, the ISS. I know that some of your applications developed 30 years ago and in the course of those 30 years are still being used to missions in Mars and the moon. Yeah, so, oh my gosh, where to even start? So, so um, I was a co-founder of a company called Paragon Space Development Corporation that today is, is thriving and doing and has many technologies on the International Space Station and, and various spacecraft. Uh, one of the very early things uh, we developed uh, that I have a patent on is actually these very small enclosed ecosystems that we can use as a life support system for small creatures. So all the way back to Biosphere 2, which we can talk about in a minute, so it'll give it some context. Um, you know, I really wanted to understand how we can make these very self-sustaining ecosystems and, and use them for habitats on the moon or Mars and to start out by using them on, on uh, a spacecraft like the International Space Station. So the first one we sent up was a, a small, I, I suppose I would say sort of soda can size uh, ecosystem that had breeding populations of animals in it. And we sent it up and it was on the shuttle, on the Mir space station. Then we sent it on to the International Space Station where it was for almost 18 months. And actually it, it was very exciting. We, we had it on the space station for 18 months. And for the very first time in history, we bred animals through complete life cycles. And th these are like little shrimp and snails and things like that. And actually, we worked with a number of researchers from Japan to really study uh, what these creatures do in these ecosystems. And depending on how deep you want to go, I can tell you all about it. But then um, other kinds of things that, that uh, the team has done, and, and also my, my co-founder, Taylor McCallum, who's been with me on this journey for 30 years, um, his technology is on the International Space Station actually providing the drinking water for the state station. And that was technology that we developed at that first company as well. 
And, and Jane, you've advised Elon Musk on SpaceX as well, right? Yeah, so way before he even started SpaceX, again, at Paragon, the first company I, I was part of the founding team of, um, he was sent by JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to uh, contact us about the idea of sending a small greenhouse to Mars. You know, imagine the money shot. You've got a small shoebox sized greenhouse on Mars, and, and in the foreground is Mars. Then you've got this flowering plant, and then behind it is space. And way in the distance, you can see this little tiny red, blue dot. Not a red dot, that would be Mars, what we see from here. Now turn that in reverse. And this little pale blue dot, that's Earth. So that, so that was what he was wanting to do and sort of inspire us to go to Mars. So we were developing this, this small greenhouse uh, to send to Mars. He goes off to, to, to Russia to go buy rockets. And of course, on his way back, decides he's going to start SpaceX, and to a degree, the rest is history. But then uh, we also helped him early on in the company, uh, actually developing some of the concepts of what we now know as, as the Dragon capsule uh, and uh, some of his early work with NASA as well. It was really exciting times in this industry. I mean, it was just incredibly exciting times. I'm just wondering, how did all of that put together now takes you to this vision, this ambition to take all of us to space. Why did you think about that? <laughs> well, it does partly go back to my time in Biosphere 2. I'm just going to blame it on being <laughs> locked up in Biosphere 2 for two years. So, <laughs> so yeah, so Biosphere 2 uh, was something that I was really lucky to be on the design team of, and that was in the 80s. And then um, in, in 1991, September the 26th, Eight of us walked into this entirely sealed ecosystem and stayed there for two years and 20 minutes. And it had its own miniature rainforest, a savanna, an ocean, a marsh, a green, uh, and, and a desert, and then where we grew our food and where we lived. And we recycled all our water. We recycled all our air. I was breathing the same oxygen over and over again. I was breathing, drinking the same water over and over again. I knew every moment of every day that my oxygen was coming from all the plants around me and that the CO2 I was breathing out was creating the plants that we were then eating. So it was this, like, this crazy cycle. I saw the edges of my world and I could see people outside looking in and that was Biosphere 1, the planet that we all live on outside, and we were living, living in Biosphere 2. And it gives you this extraordinary perspective on this planet we live on, right? When you live in a tiny biosphere like that, it gives you this incredible perspective about the fact that we are, in fact, a singular human family on Spaceship Earth. And so... That, as it turns out, is exactly the same experience that astronauts have living on the space station or on the shuttle looking down at Earth. So when astronauts go to space, they have this incredible perspective of seeing our Earth in space. And it's very moving and, and it's transformational. It actually changes to a degree the way they think about our planet. And they too see us as a singular human family on Spaceship Earth. And it's such a powerful experience that ever since then, I've wanted to take everybody to space so that they too can have that amazing experience. So let's go. <laughs> so we are at the stage when there is so much excitement about space, Bezos, yeah. Branson, and you know, space access inspiration for, we're that much closer to going to space for you, for space perspective, no rockets, it's a giant balloon. How new is this technology? How does it work? So we are taking eight passengers and a pilot in a sealed capsule in shirt sleeve environments, sitting like this. We will be lifting off early in the morning and a huge space balloon like the one you see in the image behind me will be lifting that capsule to space and we will be going smoothly and gently to space. That's what's so different about this. 
It allows us to go gently, no high G forces, no training, no suits, none of that, right? We can just be sitting there comfortably. It takes us two hours to get to space. We'll be up there for a couple of hours and then we'll gently come back down, splash down, a ship will be there to bring us all ashore. Uh, that's, our, that's our spaceship Neptune. And this technology, actually some of the technology has been around a long time. So what makes this marvelous as well is not only incredibly comfortable, it's incredibly safe. So the space balloon has actually been flown by NASA and others around the world for decades, thousands of times. Uh, and then between the balloon and the capsule is actually the kind of parachute that is pre-deployed as a backup system the entire flight. And it's the kind of system that brings capsules back from space or actually has taken payloads from this altitude back down to ground thousands of times and has never failed. So it's also incredibly safe. So it's a super comfortable and very safe system uh, that the technologies have been really proven. You're going to be 30 kilometers in the air. Is that really being in space? Is that defined yeah. as being in space? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question, right? So um, it turns out that there really is no universal definition of space. So then what is space? How do we think about what space is? So one way to think about it is that we are going to be above 99% of Earth's atmosphere. We're going to be in that last 1%. And that last 1% of the atmosphere extends thousands of kilometers. The International Space Station is that last 1%, in that last 1%. Around the capsule that we'll be taking uh, that when it's at the top of its apogee, at the top of its flight, will essentially be in a vacuum. So to all intents and purposes, it's, it's space. So we call it the edge of space. And when you look out the window, you are going to have the quintessential astronaut experience, which is going to be that of seeing that iconic thin blue line of the atmosphere, the curvature of the Earth, sun in the completely black sky. <laughs> it's going to be completely mad, right? It's just, <laughs> it's just going to be awesome. The blue marble, right? That's what the astronauts uh, referred to. There, there is a question here, Jane, from Hoi Pham. She wants to know what's different about the Earth that you see from space today from what you saw back in the past. Oh, wow. Now that's a question. So I haven't <laughs> personally seen it. So what I can tell you is what we see in satellite images and what I have been told by astronauts when they see it, right? I mean, there's huge, vast change. And in fact, what is, I had this marvelous story that was told to me by, by an astronaut, actually a space tourist that went up. And, uh, you know, he was telling me about being on this. This was on the International Space Station. And so he would spend a fair amount of time looking out the window and he had a camera and he was taking pictures of things out the window. And he was just shocked by initially just really surprised by how there was really nowhere on Earth today that you do not see the effect of humans whether it's seeing a city, whether it's seeing a road or even a fire, unfortunately, or you know, a mine or where people have put a farm, uh, even in the ocean now, we can see ships all over the ocean, right? So, so that is certainly one thing that is very clear that one would see from space now uh, compared to decades ago, uh, if one were going to space then. In terms of regulation, Jane, are you regulated just like Virgin Galactic and SpaceX? Yes, we're regulated like a spaceship by the FAA, uh, by the Office of Commercial Space Flight, just like every other launch company. And when we take a look at the technology, in the end, it is about having the technology for critical mass, right? We're talking about taking lots of people to space. I mean, how do we get to critical, critical mass and how... How challenging is it technologically? So with our uh, system, you know, I think we're going to be able to get there fairly quickly, right? So when I think we think about space flight, one way to think about it now is sort of in layers. So there's this, um, the first thing is to go suborbital, which means we just go up and then we come back down. We don't really ever go completely around the planet. And so with our system, 
Uh, we are going to be, once we're flying commercially in 2024, we're already going to start flying hundreds of people very quickly. Now, we're not yet in thousands and millions. That's certainly our vision, right? And so um, what's exciting uh, beyond uh, suborbital flight, then you get orbital flight, fewer people. It's going to take us longer to get to orbital flight. It's more expensive. It, it is tougher. You know, you really do need a bit more of the right stuff to, to do an orbital flight, right? You've got a lot of training. Uh, at the moment to go on these vehicles. So before we really get to sort of a lot of us going into orbital flight or to the moon, I think that's going to be a while, but I do think we are going to be see very quickly people going up to see Earth in space uh, a lot. And what's exciting about that are in sort of in two ways, you looking out going to space and looking down at Earth. So as we start getting a lot of people going to space, it sort of normal, in, increasingly normalizes the concept of us all going to space, right? And, and also brings more people into this excitement of going to space. So that's one thing. Another thing is that I think it's going to have sort of a huge secondary effect having so many people looking down on Earth from this vantage point and having that perspective change that astronauts talk about, that I talked about. It changes you. It changes you perceptively. And I think it will have a ripple effect through society, through humanity. You talked about how we will get to critical mass really quickly. Does it also mean that the prices will come down very quickly? I mean, right now we're taking a look at what, $125,000 to, to get a seat. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I think uh, we are, got, our vision is to bring the price down pretty quickly, right, as quickly as we can. Uh, but, it, but it's going to be a while. And to be honest, um, you know, there is such huge demand for this. I mean, you can see the pricing, Virgin Galactic put their prices up. You know, Blue Origin is pretty pricey. I mean, I think the unfortunate situation is that, that the prices are going to be high for a while. But uh, I do think the technology is there. I do think the know-how is there and the will is there to, over time, bring the prices down to where it's much more affordable. There are naysayers, right, Jane? I mean, great to have it on the bucket list, unlikely to be a priority. And most people would rather have engineers uh, spend more time and resources on perhaps getting us from Singapore to Paris than Earth to space more quickly, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so why? So, so, so here's... Um, it's interesting. So when you look at the beginning of any new technology, it's difficult for us to imagine how that can change the world for the better. So remember when airplanes were first invented? You know, when, when we first flew, when, when I'm saying we, I mean humanity first flew, when the Wright brothers first flew and others, you know, all we could think about then was, oh, I guess we're gonna fly some mail across the country. Nobody at the time could possibly imagine that it would be millions of us flying around the world every year. I mean, it was just outside the realm of imagination. I mean, it, it was then initially for the wealthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, remember the ads way back in the day that you may have seen, uh, sort of these historic ads of, you know, people flying on airplanes, uh, you know, economy was like super, super first class. It was the wealthy. And now look, now it's incredibly affordable. It, it changes people's lives. And we can even think of the same way as com uh, with computers. Nobody can figure out what on earth we're going to do with computers, really, when we, when we first designed and, and brought computers to the market. And now look, they're, they're in every aspect of our life. Space flight is the same. We're at the very beginnings of space flight, and we're just seeing the start of this industry. And it's hard for us to imagine how it is going to change our lives in the future. I want to take a look at the aspect of uh, diversity in the space sector, women in the yeah. space sector. Only one in five space workers are women, and it's fluctuated around that level for the past 30 years. Um, just to give you some stats out there, 225 spacewalks have been taken, only 15 were by women. Almost 600 people have gone to space, fewer than 70 are women. Why do you think the number is so low for women? 
Well, so look, I think uh, look, there's a lot of reasons, right? I mean, I think I mentioned earlier on that when I felt with my, the beginning of my career, I used to be the only woman in the room. Mm. I really was. I mean, it was very often I'd be on a panel and I was the only woman. I'd be on a stage and I was the only woman. I'd walk into a conference room and I was the only woman. I'd be on a, a team and I was the only woman. Now it is not the case. It really isn't. So it is uh, the case, but the numbers are still low. Absolutely. Completely agree with you. The numbers are still low. So, so what are the reasons? You know, there are the old, you know, pipeline. We're not getting enough mm-hmm. women in STEM and all of that. And there is definitely truth to that. I mean, there's definitely truth that we, we aren't having enough young women feeling confident that they can really succeed in STEM or maybe even understanding why it's for them. What is exciting now, though, where sort of the advent of, of commercial space and, and particularly in, in, in a business like mine, you don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a rocket science to be in space now. Yes, please, if you want to be a rocket science or an engineer, please go and do that because we definitely need more women in that. But you can be in marketing. You can, you know, there's all kinds of professions now that we need in space that that really throw open the doors to almost anybody who wants to to, to be a professional, to step into and bring true value to this, to this industry. So I'm, I'm excited. And I, I also think that let's, let's also be clear. It's not just women, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's diversity of all kinds. And I also think we have to be incredibly intentional about it. Bringing diversity into the workplace doesn't just happen. Unfortunately, it doesn't just magically go, you know, people start walking in the front door. You have to be very intentional about it. Um, We're lucky in that we're a company that can, in fact, uh, hire people who are not citizens of America. That is not the case for a lot of space companies as well, right? So we're actually able to get much more diverse quite quickly. Um, which is awesome. And it's, it's incredibly important. I, I, I wonder sometimes if people don't really understand why diversity is so important. It's not just because we want to be inclusive. That's, of course, important. But from the business point of view, it's critical because you get different thoughts. You get different cultures. You get, you get a diversity of, of ideas And that makes innovation, that makes strength of culture, that makes strength of companies, that that brings about innovation. We can see all the values, but in the end, it is really about the mindset, breaking the barrier in the space industry. I mean, if you take a look at the spacesuit, right, it's not been redesigned in 40 years, they say, and it does not accommodate women very well. So, what needs to be done? What are the concrete steps that need to be taken to break that barrier? I think what we're, what we're talking about here today, right? I mean, for a company like us, I, I really truly believe that everybody has to take this on board. And by that, I mean, every company has to take this on board. You know, our governments need to take this on board. And, and you know, and we are making some progress, but it doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. So, you know, in in our company, uh, you know, it was really fun and and sort of exciting that we were, we actually uh, built for a particular project, the first spacesuit that was designed, built and flown for 40 years in America. And that was actually for uh, the Stradex space dive that we did. We took up Alan Eustace. Uh, Google, uh, then Google executive to, ba- to break the uh, Red Bull Stratos jump, which was really exciting. It was a space dive under a space balloon. We took him up to 136,000 feet, intentionally dropped him, uh, and uh, he free fell for five minutes and broke the speed of sound and safely landed. Um, and, and it was a very exciting project. Uh, we didn't have that many women on our, on our uh, team, and we really tried hard. Uh, it, it was fascinating. So Now, though, with this new company, we actually have a lot of women. I'm so thrilled. We have a lot of women. We we are uh, really putting the human at the center of our design, of our experience. 
Uh, and, and, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take for leaders to be very intentional about this and for the right reasons. You talked about having a lot of women on your team. Give us a sense of uh, what that amounts to in terms of percentage. How many, what's the percentage of women on your team? So we're probably about 40%. I actually haven't done the math, but it's probably about 40%. Um, and, so, you know, got head of manufacturing, you know, as a woman, I, you know, certainly uh, on the, the um, um, sales and marketing team, of course, a lot of those positions that one might imagine. Uh, but I'm really happy to say that we all had also have uh, some women on our technical team, which is, mm. which is exciting. You know, I've read um, reports in the course of this research. Some are saying that the future of space is women. When if you say the future of space is going to be women, what time frame are you are you looking at? Possibly, you know, considering that the journey for women has been so slow so far. Yeah. So you know, I, let's broaden that out and say the future of of everything. Right. I mean, I think it's not just space. I mean, if you look at if you look at a, a lot of, of professions and boardrooms and leaderships, you know, I think there is now a beginning to be an understanding in a much broader way that inclusivity of all sorts is really important. I mean, we're we're showing what there is data now that's de- that is actually showing numbers that show that when you have more women on a board of directors of a firm, it tends to actually perform better than where you have you know, only men. And I'm sure the same is true of other kinds of diversity as well. So I keep coming back to whilst I know we are talking about women and that is the focus of this conversation, but it is inclusivity of all sorts is so critical. You know, and I, I do think it's, important to note that there are now, um, you know, in, you know, standard HR departments, we are beginning to get inclusivity specialists. And it's sad to think that we have to have somebody that specializes in, in inclusivity. However, it's critically important because how we write job descriptions actually tends to bring in more women or dissuade women to apply for that job how you write your website. You know, it, it's really interesting that, that there's things that we can do that are fairly subtle that can have massive impact on whether we do or do not attract a wide, diverse group of people to come and work for you. Jane, there's a question here from Susan Hanna. She wants to know how EQ plays out in STEM sectors. Oh, wow, that is such an interesting question. So, um, I don't know that I can talk about it broadly. I can talk about it from my perspective in the companies that I have been fortunate enough to found. And um, it's, it's really interesting. So, you know, I think there is definitely that sort of stereotype of, you know, the, 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 the geeky engineer, and there's, there's certainly a component to that. And every engineer that I would know would that I know would certainly fess up to being the geek, but that doesn't mean that they don't have EQ. So um, it, it's critically important. So, um, you know, I think uh, in, in our uh, companies, we definitely put huge emphasis on culture. So it's not just skill. It is absolutely the culture that you build in your company. It's critical. Uh, you know, it, it, it's critical for performance. It's, let's face it. I mean, just from the, the humanity side, we all spend more of our waking time at work than anywhere else. So let us put humanity in our workplace. It's critical that we do. And having EQ as a central part of, of how we all listen to each other and work with each other, not only makes the company stronger, it makes us stronger as individuals. We talked earlier about wanting to see a seismic shift in the gender balance in the space industry. And it is about having that that exposure at the earlier stage 
you know, in life to things like aerospace engineering. And it is about, like we heard from Georgette say earlier that we need role models. I mean, is there greater pressure on you and other women within the space industry to be more out there, to be seen as a role model? So that's interesting. So I haven't personally found pressure per se. Um, I uh, am certainly uh, very excited to get out and talk to young women and, uh, you know, help in any way I can. I think certainly what is really important is that we live by, by doing. Um, you know, I think talking about all of these things is critically important. Doing them is more important. And so by doing them, I mean having really intentional processes within whether it's your company, your school, your institution, whatever it is that are intentionally um, inclusive. And, you know, even, even at home, right? I mean, I, I, I think these things have huge ripple effects. You know, I keep going back to, to that essay I wrote as a young woman. And, you know, I was lucky to have been in an environment where I was encouraged to be all I can be. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone has that opportunity. And so I do think that it is a part, uh, it behooves us women and it is important for us that we do encourage young women and people of color to really be all they can be. You know, I, I, uh, I have a, a a favorite, I have a number of quotes that are my favorite quotes. And, and one of them is, if you think it's possible, if you think something is impossible, it is for you. And it doesn't mean it's impossible. It means you have to deal with what's in your own mind that's telling you mm. it's impossible. And it's up to us to help show people ways of being, ways of thinking, way of doing that really throw open the door on possibilities for people. It was really fun. So I'm just reminded of, so, so I had, um, I, I uh, wrote a book with the UN um, called Champions for Change, uh, and it became a middle school program. And um, it was very much a hands-on school program. And we had, um, we, we would take uh, middle school kids out. One of the things we did was take middle school kids out into, you know, just look at different companies and different things that were going on in the community. And I will never forget it. It just was like, just really brought tears to my eyes. This one child at the end of this tour, we had taken him through and along with his students through uh, an airplane manufacturing facility. And it, they were building parts for airplanes. And when he came out of all of this and he got to sit in an airplane and he realized that there was actually a career where you could go and make airplanes and make parts for airplanes and you didn't need a PhD. And he said at the end of it, you know, everybody in my family is in fast food. They all work in McDonald's or something like that. It never occurred to me that there was something else I could do. And sometimes it's these simplest things that we could do that throw open the door on a possibility for a child. And also, Jane, it is about empower, empowerment, right? The skills that we can give them. What skills can we equip our girls, our young women, so that they can play an active role in the space industry, in science, innovation, and technology? Is it about you know, getting exposed to engineering, how do we equip them? So look, I, I think we talk a lot about the technical skills. And of course, that's, that's critically important. You know, all of the math and all the science and, and all of that. Of course, that's, that goes without saying. If you don't have that, it's going to be very difficult to get into science. But what I think is perhaps even just as important is, is some of the personal skills, like confidence, learning to have true confidence, and that you can speak confidently and present yourself confidently. Uh, I, you know, these kinds of what some call softer skills are critically important for our, for our young women. I mean, they just are. I want to take um, 
some of the questions coming in, quite a number of them. There's a question here. We have space tourism as older age right now. Any insights on what the next few hits of the space industry might be? We love looking into the crystal ball, Jane. So the next few hits, what, what does that mean? Like, uh, the next like what, what can we expect in the space tourism industry? Okay, so What's now it's exciting. Yeah, yeah. So let's look back in history for a second before we look into the future. So if you look back into the early 2000s, uh, in the first 10 years of this millennium, only eight people, eight private citizens went to space. Mm -hmm. For the next 15 years, nobody went. And now this year, we have way more private citizens that have gone just this year than have been in all time in history. Next year, we're going to see exponentially more. The year after, as we start flying, you're going to start seeing exponentially more. So the first thing you're going to see is a lot of people beginning to go to space. It is going to become just a routine activity. Oh, yeah, another space flight. Yay, yay. You know, in the near term, what we're going to see, all right, so this year we've already seen some exciting things. Um, you know, we've got uh, uh, William Shatner going up later this mm -hmm. month, uh, which is, that, that's just so awesome. Come on, how great is that? I'm such a tricky fan. You know, you got, you got to love it. Um, so, so things like that. We're going to see a lot of these sort of big stunts coming up. Uh, you know, early next year, we, we've got uh, several people going up to the International Space Station, which is really cool. And then we're going to see a lot of people fly. You know, we will eventually get to the moon. It might still take us a little long, but we are going to see people going to the moon. And um, I think that's super exciting. I, I think it's fantastic. We talked a little bit about this earlier. Maybe you can elaborate more. There's a question here asking you, women need to participate in the space programs. Space programs need women. The world needs women to participate. Why? Why do we need women? Yeah, what difference would it make? What do women bring? I, I've read somewhere as well that women are behind a lot of the uh, uh, innovation in the space industry. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of innovation. So, so I think, um, look, I can throw a bunch of stats at you talking about, you know, women led businesses tend to perform very well. Um, you know, it's fun. So I think I mentioned earlier that I, for most of my career, have been one of the only women in the room. And for the first time in my career, I am working with an all female team. I have never done this before, ever, in my entire career. It is completely different. It is completely different than working with an all, all male team. It, 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 I really didn't know that until I worked with a whole group of women. How, so? How is it different, Jane? Oh, yeah. So um, it's hard to describe, really. <laughs> and some of it is simply in the stereotype. You know, we're, we're, the women are very caring of each other. Uh, you know, we, we really do, uh, in a very overt way, um, support each other, which isn't to say that the men don't. It's just very different. You know, the energy is different. How we engage with each other is different. How we, how we think about problems is different. We, we, what I am really enjoying is, you know, that we, we get sort of the, the diversity with men when we really start tackling some of these exciting issues of how are we going to um, really have this experience of taking people to space and have it exciting for both men and women. I find we definitely need to have both men and women in the room because we come up with different answers. You have to have them both in the room because we literally come up with different answers and that's critically important. And that's why we find in boardrooms, you know, women, uh, again, it sounds stereotypic, but I think there's a, a grain of truth to it, that women tend to think more about the consequences of what we're doing and how it impacts uh, uh, the families in the business, you know, the families of people in the business and, and you know, everybody's well-being within the business. We just tend to do that more naturally, whether that's nurture or nature, we can probably fight that all day. But we do tend to do that more naturally. And it, and it is critically important that we have those components of the discussion coming in with the men as well. And that, that also works on the technical side. A question here from uh, Robin Dittrich. 
What kinds of jobs and industries will luxury space travel create and where would these jobs be? Oh, yeah, that's cool. Well, so it's everything. So in our business, right, uh, it's everything from designing, manufacturing the spaceship, it's avionics, it's uh, designing, manufacturing the space balloon, you know, it's hospitality, right? So we are, we're an experience company, you know, we're getting musicians involved, we're getting artists involved, we're getting scientists involved. So what's really exciting is we actually have researchers flying payloads on our vehicle. We have scientists and we have artists flying their art on our payloads. So what you're really seeing now with what's happening with commercial space flight it is it's really going from you know simply a hardware based business to being a human based business and everything that goes with that and the culture that goes with that so there's just a really huge broad variety of of careers that are now being uh, uh, open to people. And I say, come one, come all. I mean, we just need a whole variety of, of skills in this, storytellers, uh, videographers. I mean, it's just, it's endless. Mm. Uh, there is a reality check question here from Dr. Ramona Miranda. Uh, she says, how does luxury space travel sit alongside a world where women and girls struggle to access financing or access education. Yeah, so so I, I think that's awesome. So first of all, let's let's think about what we think, what we mean by luxury. So in this context, you know, in in well, in the world of luxury, actually, what's happening is people really are going really wanting to have meaningful experiences. Um, and for us, luxury really means about it being comfortable and physically accessible. Uh, and I, you know, I think I talked earlier about uh, our, you know, our mission is to take a wide diversity of people. So we are taking, of course, wealthy people who can afford the tickets to go. I think I mentioned that, you know, we're taking artists, we are doing groundbreaking climate change research on our vehicles as well. Uh, so, you know, for us, we, uh, the uh, uh, test flight that we did earlier this year in June, uh, I was really happy that we were able to fly two different experiments from children who, uh, these were middle school kids who won uh, uh, competitions to fly. Both teams were, were young women. And that wasn't intended. That's just who won, which is so awesome. Uh, we also uh, flew art uh, from young people who had won competition uh, to fly their art. Uh, we also flew uh, art of professional artists who were all three women. It's a collective. It's a female artist collective. Uh, so one of the things to remember uh, that I remember about spaceflight is that it has an outsized ability to inspire. You know, in, in, in my generation, it was Apollo. And mm. it inspired probably two generations of young girls and, and boys to not necessarily go into STEM, but to do things that they never imagined possible because they saw these people doing these incredible things. I mean, it just makes you think about what's possible. Mm -hmm. And so for me, part of what we're doing, not only giving people opportunity to fly their experiments and their art, but is to inspire. That's what we're doing. We're inspiring, not just the people that fly, but also the people that participate in every other way. Just thinking about the possibilities and... Uh what you can possibly do and contribute. A question here on sustainability, Jane. Yeah. Uh, put sustainability in context for us in the context of space. Yeah, so gosh, there's so many directions to go in that, right? So um, first of all, that's, again, I love to go back to history and think about where we've come from. So, um, you know, the most downloaded image in history is that 
incredible view of Earth in space that was taken on December the 24th on Christmas Eve uh, and sent back to Earth in 1968. And it was the image that allowed humanity to look back at our planet and go, wow, we're a planetary species. We do live all here on planet Earth <laughs> together. And that was taken from Apollo. That was an accidental image that was taken from Apollo. So um, space gives us the ability to, to really look back at planet Earth and has done, through, done so throughout its history. And, you know, of course, it goes without saying everything that's going on with, with satellites that allows us to really study our planet and, and all of that. On the flip side, you know, what about thinking about the carbon footprint and, you know, all of those things that we do with the vehicles that we use? Um, I am really proud to say that the vehicle that we fly, Spaceship Neptune, uh, is an emissions uh, neutral, it's an emissions free vehicle. Um, we uh, do actually offset the carbon footprint of our entire company. So we are incredibly aware of, of our sustainable footprint. I was actually really lucky enough to be involved back in the early 2000s in a really cool project that was in Africa, actually. Um, and it was one of the, uh, I worked uh, with the World Bank and the UN uh, on one of the very first calculations uh, of how you think about carbon sequestration. In this case, it was a mangrove forest so that this group could actually um, use their mangrove forest, not just for feeding their goats and for mm -hmm. making honey, but also selling carbon credits. So I'm, I'm quite familiar with how to think about you know, sort of our carbon footprint. Uh, and it's incredibly important that we do. And, and so we put that incredibly central in, in how we operate our business. It's just part of being a planetary biospheric citizen. The next question takes it a step further. This question from uh, Chui Feng Chong, she's in Switzerland right now. And she's saying, she's asking, what are your perspectives on women's role in global sustainability businesses? Oh yeah, are you kidding? Critical. Um, yeah, so, gosh, I mean, I love these, this questioning, right? Like I, like, I hate to say, guys, we don't need you, but of course we do. We just need a diversity of thought. We need people who are, who, who put our, the way we think about our planet first, right? And, and that's a critical role for women in, in, in every way we think uh, about the world. And, you know, when we think about education and when we think about, uh, you know, we, we, we know that as we educate women around the world, uh, it actually tends to have a dramatic effect on the, um, the income of the communities in that environment. But they tend also to really care deeply about the, their communities and the greater community, which is their natural environment. And a lot of that comes through education and a lot of that comes through them learning very simple things about how to behave in their environment and how to, to grow. Uh, I mean, look at the amazing thing that was done in, done in Kenya with planting trees across Kenya. I mean, what was amazing about that was, was they actually changed the microclimate um, that, was, that was led by the Nobel uh, Laureate, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting her name right now, that, that led that incredible effort to replant, replant trees. And, and what it did was planted fruit trees for the local communities, but it also planted forests across the country and reignited the microclimates that had been robbing of the local community of the rainfall that they'd been getting. So some of these sustainability efforts that are started by women have these incredible multiplier effects of not only impacting their communities in this incredibly positive way, but they impact the entire environment. So the whole greater community benefits, including of course our brethren in our biosphere. Question here on the advice you could give future women entrepreneurs. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Wow, how to how where to start there? So first Forget of all, <laughs> what? 
Yeah. Go, get it, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, so throw your heart down in front of you and run to catch up. That's, that's what it is being an entrepreneur. You're constantly running to catch up, um, which is awesome. Look, honestly, um, I have always lived by, uh, you know, people will tell you it's about resilience. It absolutely is about resilience. There's no question about it. You, you have to have resilience. You have to have confidence in yourself. You need to surround yourself with people that will boost your confidence in yourself. You need to hire the best people into your company that you possibly can and don't compromise on that. But it's not just the skills. It's who they are as human beings that is critically important that will help you multiply your own greatness so much more than you could ever imagine. Jane, just one final question before we wrap up. I mean, such a fascinating 30-year journey. What's been the biggest highlight for you? I'm sure there are many, but what's top of mind? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm only allowed to pick one. I mean, it was amazing okay, to be in the too. biosphere. I mean, the biosphere was amazing. It was outrageous to have to have experiments on the International Space Station. It was just insane to be working with Alan Eustace to take him up to the to stratosphere. That was extraordinary. The thing that I am most excited about now is taking all of us to space so that we can experience our beautiful planet from that perspective. Jane, it is on my bucket list at some point when it's possible, I hope to be there with you. Jane Pointer, we thank you so much for your time today. It's been inspiring. I mean, I think there's so much excitement out there. And thank you so much for your generous time for joining us. I know you're, you've been very, very busy, but you made time for us to inspire our participants. And I also like to thank the U.S. Embassy in Singapore for the support for this program. We thank you for joining us again. Hope to see you for uh, our next session. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>